because there's been a lot of questions and confusion about the polymerase chain reaction in uh, recent uh, weeks and months, I thought I'd give it a shot here. What you see in front of you is a duplex of uh, DNA, the top strand being red, the bottom strand being in black. And what I want to show you is that, in fact, uh, how to amplify this uh, particular segment of DNA. Now, this DNA would really look like a, ha uh, like a ladder, kind of a twisted ladder. And you can see down below here, we have little smaller uh, segments of DNA called primers, single-stranded DNA, that matches up with the left-hand side of the red top strand and the right-hand side of the uh, bottom black strand. The, what there is, it goes from 5' prime to 3'. prime. It's directional. Now, in the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, you just crank up the temperature so that you break apart this duplex of DNA, melt it apart, and what happens then is as you cool it back down, these primers will anneal or match up with the corresponding sequence on the big stretch of DNA, uh, just as I'm showing you right here. And then what happens is then the DNA polymerase, the enzyme, will come in and fill the gap uh, using uh, nucleotides and uh, deoxynucleotides, as a matter of fact. And so what I show you here in the dotted line is new stretch of DNA that makes one contiguous red strand, or now up above, the new DNA made by the polymerase of one contiguous piece of DNA, uh, the black strand. And now you have two sets of, uh, of very similar, uh, or hopefully exact if it's a very high fidelity polymerase, exact pieces of uh, double-stranded DNA on the top and on the bottom. You start with one, you end up with two. That's each cycle of PCR, and this goes over and over and over again. So you basically double the amount of uh, template if your primers are working properly, as is shown here. If they're not designed properly, you're going to end up with heterogeneous products. In other words, products that aren't all the same, the products that are much different. And I'm showing you here where the red primer down below will stick to the middle of the black primer. Not where I want it, but it's, that's where it's going to go. And so it gives a much smaller product of double-stranded DNA. On the top strand, my black primer sticks towards the left-hand side of the, of, of the red strand of DNA, making, again, a very small product of DNA. They're not the same. We have a very small, tiny product of double-stranded DNA on the top and a little bit bigger product of double-stranded DNA on the bottom. But once again, they are not the same. And this is something that you really want to avoid. It's a problem in that if people don't design their primers correctly, you know, stuff happens. That's just the way it is. Here we have two sets of uh, double-stranded DNA now getting melted apart, blasted apart, denatured, if you will, by uh, the heat. We raise that up to about 95 degrees uh, C. And here then, as we cool down, the red primers will come in and anneal or match up to the uh, black strand of DNA, the bottom strand. And again, the black primers will come in and bind or anneal to the red uh, strand of DNA, the top strand. And there are polymerase uh, enzyme will come in and fill in the gap, really, uh, utilizing uh, deoxynucleotides. And so now we started off with two strands of double-stranded DNA, and because we've gone through another cycle of, uh, of the polymerase chain reaction, now we have four, four complete strands of duplex DNA, double-stranded DNA. And let me just catch up here with the uh, fill in the red uh, gaps. Here we go. So again, we started off with one strand of duplex DNA. It's called the template. And we added our primers. We blew apart the uh, duplex, annealed our primers, and off we ra ran. We got two strands, uh, two sets of uh, identical uh, DNA. And now uh, we did it again to have four. To do what's called reverse transcription, we start off with an RNA here in blue. Uh, the five prime end is on the left, and the three prime end is on the right hand side with a poly A tail. That's a normal message, uh, messenger RNA, a transcript um, that we all have, in, you know, and anything that's alive will have this. And the way we want to uh, amplify this is by first changing it over to DNA. So we'll add a poly DT uh, primer that will match up with that poly A tail. And we we'll come in with a, uh, another enzyme, another polymerase, that will then fill in that gap. And as I'm showing you right here, then in, now in red, uh, make the corresponding DNA to that particular RNA. So now we have a duplex of DNA and RNA. It's called a heteroduplex DNA-RNA hybrid. Again, 
double du double stranded nucleic acid. However, it's a DNA RNA hybrid. You can add another enzyme that will chew up the RNA, keep leaving your uh, single stranded DNA right there. And now we can go into the PCR again. So now this is called really RT PCR because we follow the RT, the reverse transcription, with a PCR. And so we're left with double stranded DNA that corresponds to the individual RNA that we that we started with and this is really the basis of a lot of the uh, claims of of uh, of uh, measles virus uh, RNA in the gut how do you detect it well this is exactly how people are claiming they're detected and again we go through the PCR process here we blow apart the uh, double stranded DNA uh, complex the hybrid, the uh, the uh, helix and uh, using heat and come in with a primer and amplify that uh, section of uh, of DNA using our DNA polymerase. And I'm showing you here in the dotted red how we how the DNA polymerase will fall, will fill in there, and show you here in the dotted black how that will uh, f uh, fill in the uh, double stranded duplex on the top. Once again, we started off with a single strand of uh, ribonucleic acid RNA, and we've gone through a couple. Uh, rounds of uh, or a single round of uh, PCR and we had two double strand DNA at the end of it. What happens if our primer doesn't work all that well? What if it doesn't bind where we intend it to bind? What if it doesn't anneal in the correct spot, the design spot? Uh, what if it's sticky and, and uh, binds non-specifically? This is what happens. You get the incorrect product. You get a product. It's just the wrong one. And if you don't know how to differentiate in between the wrong and the right product, then all you know is you have a product. And that really brings us into the next kind of phase of what I want to talk about is how do you actually measure this? Great, you go through this reaction PC, but what happens? How do you how do you know how much DNA that you've got in there? Well you run it out on a gel. And so this is like consider it like Knox blocks or a jello, where you uh here's where you have a ladder of DNA starting from big to small, top to bottom. And if you run a big sample yeah, it'll come out of there. Was that about 800? Uh, call that 800 base pairs long, as an example. Just just pulling this out as an example. However, you can also have something that's just tiny, smaller than 100 base pairs. Well, that's probably going to be your primer, because most primers are somewhere eh, around 20 uh, nucleotides long. And so I would consider the one on the right hand side to be a primer that hasn't been. Uh, incorporated into the uh, DNA product, whereas my intended DNA product was probably about 800 uh, base pairs long, which is the uh, lane in the middle. Another way is to do uh, qPCR, which is instead of running it on a gel, you just have a fluorescence assay in which a fluorescence, uh, fluorescent probe will bind or intercalate into the DNA product and show that up here. So the x-axis is uh, time, or the number of cycles, and the y-axis, up and down, is the fluorescence intensity of the dye. As, a, as you make more double-stranded DNA, you get a much higher uh, level of fluorescence. Again, it just doesn't matter. If you've got the wrong product, you're still going to get a signal. And so this is what fools do. They don't run the right controls. They just uh, see a product, ooh, ooh, I got a signal. You know, no, 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 you can't do that. Take your uh, template out and run a negative uh, template control. You know, there's gobs of controls. Design different primers. Do you get the same uh, uh, signal or not? What I'm showing you here in black is what sh it should look like if, in fact, you have no measles virus RNA in your sample at all. You do an RT followed by a PCR. That's what it should look like. You got nothing. However, if you design your primers incorrectly, it's going to look red. You're going to get a big time signal, even if there's none in there at all. And then what happens? How, how can you differentiate a good product versus bad ones? A heterogeneous product versus a nice single product? Well, you perform a melt. You crank up the temperature and look at the fluorescence. If you get a single melting peak, what I'm showing you right here in black, you're good to go. Um, then all you have really have to do is, is uh, sequence your amplicon. Your amplicon being the result of the PCR, the double-stranded DNA. What happens if you have multiple products is you get multiple peaks. And so if you don't do this, and that's what I'm showing you here, uh, kind of this saddle-looking uh, formation, if you don't do that, you're in trouble. The people who are claiming that they're finding measles all over the place aren't doing these things. And that is not what a good scientist would do. A good scientist runs their controls. Shame on you guys. Go back to school. Everybody's talking.
chain reaction. 